everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of The Nation here on the Outlaw Nation channel. I am the Outlaw, John Rogan here, still adjusting my camera, adjusting all the madness going on. You know, sometimes there are technical issues uh, that pop up, and you're not sure how to put this all together, and this is how you do it. Unfortunately, uh, the graphics don't always work. The uh, the situation gets uh, you get set behind, and so this is my life right now. <laughs> to be honest with you, uh, so much is going on in my world, and I was excited to come on and talk about. Well, excited, I guess, is the wrong word, isn't it? It's, it's the better word is more like um, I felt compelled to come on here and talk about this uh, situation that uh, just dropped a few days ago. Uh, Quiet on set, the four episode series. From Investigation Discovery, for those of you who don't know, that is what ID stands for. Uh, when you, If you watch this series, uh, probably on Max or in other places uh, there, but this is Quiet on Set, the dark side of kids' TV. So I'm going to be live tonight talking about this four-episode series. I'm not going to spend too much time getting too deep into any of the um, particulars, uh, except for maybe the Drake Bell story, which I think is pretty heartbreaking, devastating, and... And uh, sad to watch. Um, that was episode three of the series. It bled into episode four, but really episode three was the chunk of that story. And this is all focused on Dan Schneider and um, uh, an actor who I grew up watching on Head of the Class. I remember him being one of the guys, uh, one of the girls, Robin Givens was in that class as well. Uh, one of the actors in that class, all led by Howard Hessman, of course, on ABC. I loved that show. That show was kind of like Welcome Back Cotter for that generation, like for that because the 70s was Welcome Back Cotter, head of the class kind of a little bit like the 80s. And we had more nerds in that class uh, and being be, mixing in with people who aren't necessarily nerds. So I really liked that show. So I had a soft spot for this guy um, when he was doing that show. Um, and when it started popping up in the 2000s, early 2000s, because I was in L.A. by this time, and I would drive by that Nickelodeon building all the time there on Olive, I think it is, or Barham, one of those streets there in Burbank. Uh, and I would just be, you know, kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm aware of Nickelodeon. I'm, I've aged out of the demographic of all their shows, um, or so I thought. Uh, but when I, so I just was always like impressed with Nickelodeon, impressed with what they were able to do, kids TV, you know. And I think the series does a great job of showcasing how important Nickelodeon was to children and teenage, young teens and young adults back then and how important that influence of those shows were uh, for a lot of young people who were getting into um, the business or who were getting or who were uh, wanting something to watch that wasn't uh, just their um, their parents or their grandparents shows. This was a, a network that was creating shows that was tailor made to their age and their demographic. And one of the big people creating those shows was Dan Schneider, who uh, who initially was a writer who wrote one of the episodes ahead of the class. And as the uh, show points out, or the series points out, uh, he discovered Amanda Bynes, and that was really his. Uh, launching off point, discovering Amanda Bynes um, and moving her on to all that and then moving her into her own show and everything that happened from there. So a lot in this series was explored. We are going to talk about some some rough situations, some uh, tough retelling of certain stories and moments and incidents with people around uh, working for Dan Schneider at the time, some of the toxicity, some of the uh, sexism, some of the race, alleged racism. Uh, and all of this stuff, to be clear, this is all alleged stuff from people who worked with Dan Schneider. And Dan Schneider came out with a 19-minute apology uh, that THR platformed. Um, and it was uh, moderated. I wouldn't say there was any journalistic approach to this at all. And we're going to find that out when we watch it. It was moderated by one of his actors from iCarly, Boogie O. So I'm, or Boogie O, whatever, how, I don't know how they say it, but I, I'm going to watch that later on. We're going to go through that entire 19-minute interview, and I'm going to show you the places where he's um, manipulating the message, and where I believe he's manipulating the message, and where he's not really taking responsibility while lying to you that he's taking responsibility. So there's a lot to explore in this, and uh, I appreciate you all joining me live on a Friday at uh, 5 p.m. PT, or a little bit after 5 p.m. PT because of my technical issues um and of course if you want to send in stream labs or super chats you can do so through the course of the show um if anybody is out there who is who happens to stumble upon this live show and, and i mean this from the bottom of my heart if you're someone who has had 
any kind of interaction with Dan Schneider that you um, want to discuss or you want to bring up while we're doing this live show, uh, you can uh, put it in the chat um, and I will read it out on the chat, uh, read it out during the show uh, for anybody who might stumble upon this um, and wants to speak about it. Or if anybody is experiencing any toxicity themselves in their workplace environments that's connected to some of the toxicity that was going on, allegedly, I want to make this sure that very clear. I don't want to get sued by Dan Schneider, but allegedly uh, during these shows, uh, let us know in the comment section below as well. Uh, and of course, remember to subscribe to the channel before we jump into the meat of all of this. Hit that subscribe button, hit that bell button, button so you know when we're dropping all the content we do in the Outlaw Nation channel. The hot mic just dropped yesterday. The Geek Buddies dropped yesterday. I did a re uh, trailer reaction for the new Penguin series, the teaser trailer that dropped this morning, and the Beetlejuice teaser that dropped yesterday. So uh, there's been a lot of smoke coming off the Outlaw Nation uh, operating systems over the last few days. Uh, with a lot of videos dropping and this is another one uh, that i felt compelled to do and you know me uh when something calls me i must do it and this called me to talk about here uh tonight here on on the nation and uh let's look at this this is the series here quiet on set dark side of kids tv as i said it's available on uh, max uh i ended up grading my max because they dropped the price to 140 for the year for ad for all ad free and that's a little over ten dollars a month and I think that's a fair price. They wanted two hundred initially and I told you all I would not resubscribe to Max until they dropped the price. And sure enough, they have a deal now for one hundred and forty for the whole year, uh, and it's ad free, so I don't have to worry about ads uh, and what have you there um, on Max. But anyway, I got a chance to watch this power through the four episodes. They're about forty two minutes. 43 minutes each, a little bit less than that if you don't watch the credits. And this um, documentary series was directed by Mary Robertson and Emma Schwartz. And if you catch me getting a little like, um, uh, uh, how can I say this, a little uh, emotional or hesitant or sighing, um, it's because this series really affected me. And if you guys haven't watched this series and you're watching this live spoiler review to see if you should watch the series. Um, I can tell you that you better be prepared to watch the series because it is, it's a tough, it's a tough one. And again, I come at from an outsider's perspective because I didn't grow up watching iCarly or watching the Victoria justice show. Victoria, I think is what it was called or uh, 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 the uh, Drake bell show there. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't grow up watching any of that stuff. Uh, or Good Burger. I didn't watch any of those shows, right? So, but I knew about them, and certainly some of my friends who were younger uh, grew up with them, like Vogel and and uh, Shannon and other uh, friends I have who grew up around that time. Um, they were the sweet spot for shows like that, and so I've always known about the shows. I just have never been a fan or watched them or anything like that. Uh, the Jimmy Lynn Space. Um, Spigler Sigler show, yeah, that she had, and uh, or Jim, sorry, Jim Lynn Spears. Getting her confused with the actress from The Sopranos. Yeah, Jim Lynn Spears. I never watched her show or the Ari, Aria Grande, Jeanette McCurdy show. Never watched any of that. But I was aware of all of them, and certainly Ariana Grande about to come out with Wicked later on this year, and certainly she's been a massive success. Jeanette McCurdy with her podcast and also her book recently, um, and Drake Bell, I think, uh, delivers a very powerful reveal uh, in the third episode about the sexual abuse he suffered at the hands of uh, this guy, Brian Peck. So um, we're going to get into all of that here tonight on this uh, episode of The Nation. So just warning you ahead of time that this is what we're going to get into. So, all right, again, this is a four-episode documentary here directed by Mary Robinson and Emma Schwartz that delve deeply into the dysfunction behind the scenes at Nickelodeon on specifically on Dan Schneider's shows. It starts in the 1990s and goes all the way up to present day. Uh, we have two journalists who kind of guide us through these four episodes here, Scotchy Cool and Kate Taylor, who both uh, uh, do a wonderful job of relaying the uh, point of view and the concerns and the offense that some of the stuff that they discovered in their research or that they discovered in their reporting um, came up as they were doing, uh, as they were exploring this story uh, for their respective uh, outlets. Um, 
Alexa Nicholas is a big part of this, uh, the actress from Zoe 101. Uh, and apparently she's been calling out Schneider and Nickelodeon since 2022 about some of the uh, abuse that she suffered on the set and blaming the, the studio Nickelodeon for not doing a better job of protecting her. Jeanette McCurdy is in here. She doesn't appear on screen in a interview for the show, but they use clips from her um, numerous uh, interviews that she's done recently about her memoir where she profiles a show creator, does not say his name in her biography, but makes it very clear, her autobiography, makes it very clear that she uh, suffered at the hands of this man and this man should have been called to uh, to task earlier than he was because it wasn't until the Me Too movement that Dan Schneider was finally let go from Nickelodeon because they... I assume, in my opinion, okay, again, I'm going to say this. This is all my opinions, all right? This is my my opinion. So I believe Nickelodeon didn't take the steps they needed to take until after the Me Too movement. Then they were safe to take him because the, the crowd had turned, right? Just like with um, Harvey Weinstein. You know, no, everyone knew about Weinstein. Everyone knew about what a, a, sl- a sexual, sloppy sexual predator he was. And it wasn't until Me Too that studios all of a sudden found some sort of morality um, and uh, everybody got together and got rid of him. And and plenty of people who worked with him and turned a blind eye to the things he did are still working in Hollywood. And I wonder how many Nickelodeon executives and producers and people who work with Dan Schneider are still working in Hollywood and did nothing to stop this man. Now, I know back then, as we see in the series, for those of you who watched it, if you called things out... You were labeled a troubled make a troublemaker. You were labeled a person who um, didn't go along with the plan. You were messing with people's money. You were being uh, too sensitive. All those things that you hear about people who try to blow the whistle on inappropriate behavior, we still hear it now from certain members of the YouTube community. Oh, you're being too sensitive. Oh, we can't joke about anything anymore. Oh, you're being a snowflake. Um, and that's the response because I don't want to change you change. I'm with the masses. I must be right. Not you, but we know sometimes in situations, it's the person who's having the guts to stand out on their own to call stuff out. Who's really the person in the right and not the one sitting with the masses. Um, also in the uh, show and listen, uh, Janet McCurdy, just follow up with what she said. Um, she said that Nickelodeon offered her what amounted to hush money to prevent her from going public with her, with her experience in her memoir. So that's a part of this. Um, as I said, we do uh, focus on Drake Bell as well, opening up about the experience he had uh, and what have you. So there was a lot uh, that was uh, accessed there uh, in the show as well. And, oh, I'm sorry, there's a bit more here. Let me pull it up. So I have more notes that I made as I was watching this thing to make sure I got everything uh, squared away here. So, you know, it's not always the easiest thing to get everything uh, put together here. But um, there are other uh, instances of this stuff happening as well throughout this particular series that I thought was fascinating to explore and take a look at. Um, and I want to make sure I give the proper amount of credit to those people uh, who experienced that. Um, because we had a lot of stories that came through as we were watching the show, or as I was watching the show. And for those of you who have watched the show, you know exactly uh, how many people came forward to talk about their experience over those four episodes. Um, There is the uh, writers alleged that the name of the Amanda Show character, Penelope Taint, derived from the slang term uh, for that, you know, the taint, what the taint is there on your body. You've heard that before. Um, also, Leon Frierson is uh, is in the show as well, in this show, talking about his experiences on all that and his discomfort of playing characters like Little Fetus and Captain Big Nose uh, because of the tight-fitting costumes and, of course, uh, seeing the design of those superhero outfits that basically look like a penis with balls. Um, and he was also sensitive about his growing body, being put in leotards and what have you. Um uh, and he said, you know, it's uncomfortable because it's what I have to do to stay on the show. And that's another thing that came uh, through really clear as you're watching the series is how many of these young actors who are just pursuing their dreams to become actors. Not everyone is ruthlessly ambitious at a young age. Most of most of these young actors are just wanting to have fun and be a part of this stuff and 
um, you know, act and do whatever and be famous and want the everything that comes to being successful and famous. But unfortunately, there is a dark side for some of those young actors. Uh, and some of the dark side is that you become the sole source of income for your family. So it becomes something where you can't speak up because if you lose your job, then, um, you know, you've messed it with the, fa the family's finances. And that's way too much responsibility to put a young person's shoulders, right? I, I do believe that it's better today in how people handle young actors, people handle um, young child performers. I think it's better today. I want to believe it's better today. Maybe you all can square me away on that, but I feel like the Lindsay Lohans, the um, Miley Cyruses, the other young actor and actresses, the Britney Spearses, these are the cautionary tales that we hopefully have learned from. Uh, uh, judging from what I saw on, the sh on this uh, series when I was watching it today. So another thing they get into here is the on air dare segment, which I'd never even heard of the on air dare segment, uh, which is essentially their fear factor for kids. Um, uh, Brian Hearn, who was an actor there, was interviewed as well, who was a child actor for Dan Schneider on the shows, said that I, he hated watching his fellow castmates performing these fear factor like dares, which included sitting in a tub of worms or covering themselves in peanut butter for dogs to lick off. Um, and he said, like, looking back on it now, it's very clear. Like at the time, you're not you're not comfortable, but you don't want to say anything because Dan Schneider could maybe fire you, whatever. Uh, uh, so you you just grin and bear it. But looking back on it, he's he, I think he said something like, "This is some sick dude's fantasy, seeing a young kid having a peanut butter licked off his body." Like you know, it's really uncomfortable. Some of this stuff you get into here, and uh, Tracy Hearn, who is uh, um, who is uh, uh, Brian Hearn's mom, she spoke about her black son appearing in a scene where he sold Girl Scout cookies like he was, quote, a crack dealer, unquote, on the streets. Um, and she said that Dan had a nice relationship with some of the white kids, uh, but um, uh, she and he felt that he didn't, uh, she and Brian felt that he didn't um, address the black actors, young actors with the same kind of respect and, and, and uh, closeness as he did the white actor. So that was an element of this as well. And um, when he was fired uh, off the show, Brian Hearn, his mom was um, initially blamed by Brian for this, which is a really hard thing to watch when you're watching that sequence, because, you know, uh, she really cares for her son. And uh, at a young age, your dreams are taken from you, even though you're uncomfortable and you don't know how uncomfortable you are. Um, and, um, she says that I, I felt super guilty, but later as I found out all that was going on, I feel like I saved my son from a house of horror. So that's part of this as well. We also, uh, go into these two, all that employees, Brian Peck and Jason Handy and hear about the incredibly unsettling, disturbing and disgusting behavior of these two men who indulge their child pedophilia and their um, uh, proclivity for child pornography. Um, we also hear, we uh, go even further into Brian Peck when Drake Bell speaks about his experiences at the hands of Brian Peck and how Brian Peck, uh, who was the um, translator there uh, and helped him, uh, was supposedly a guy who could help him get to the next level. He had helped Leonardo DiCaprio when he was a young child, and there's video of that with Brian Peck there. Um, and we find out that Drake Bell's dad sensed that Brian Peck had predatory instincts and was trying to separate Drake from Brian Peck, went to management, this is important, remember this, went to the people in charge and said, this is uncomfortable, I don't like this, I don't want him around my son, can we pull away? Well, Brian Peck found out about this and slowly started to move Drake and manipulate Drake away from his dad and steer him towards his mom. And because Drake's parents were divorced, Brian knew there was a division here he could take advantage of and went and took advantage of it according to the allegations in the series uh, and uh, um, connected himself with his mom, Drake Bell's mom. And that's what ended up moving Drake Bell's father away from Drake and not showing up on set anymore, not causing, uh, um, not uh, um, expressing problems with what's going on 
Uh, and that's what allowed Brian to uh, indulge his predatory instincts. And according to Drake Bell, he sexually abused him uh, in multiple ways. And Drake said, think of at one point he was asked by one of the two interviewers there, you know, what happened? Uh, what more happened? And he said he was going to respond, but then said, you know, think about the worst things a child molester would do to someone in their control. And it was basically that. And that was the moment where I had to stop the show because that was really devastating. You know, I, again, I don't know Drake Bell. Uh, like I didn't watch his stuff or anything. I've, of course I knew him as an actor and I've seen him in certain things, but I didn't know much about all this, you know, and uh, apparently he had never, told anybody about this um, except for when the accusations came, he made the accusations uh, encouraged by um, his girlfriend's mother and his mother, uh, his girlfriend at the time and his mother uh, to make these accusations. Brian Peck was found guilty. He was only sentenced to 16 months in prison. And when he came back out, this motherfucker got himself back on a Disney show the, uh, until they found out uh, that he was, uh, or they claimed they didn't know that he was a sexual predator, uh, and uh, they fired him and redid his his voiceover work. But he is in um, Adam Sandler's Bedtime Stories movie. He is in uh, uh, Anger Management, the Charlie Sheen show, and he's in a couple other things. And this guy is still in Los Angeles. So. I don't understand 16 months. And at some point, this country needs to understand the murder that child molestation is. And it is. It is murder. You are essentially killing a segment of a child's life. And I hope you're caught so that you stop. But, like, you are murdering a segment of the child's life. 16 months is chicken feed. I believe serial child predators should be put in jail for the rest of their lives. Uh, I don't believe in rehabilitation for this nonsense because rehabilitation implies that they can get you back to a place that you existed at before. Rehabilitation can work for a murderer who maybe didn't want to kill and then a moment or situations or whatever caused him to do it. If you've been wanting to kill your entire life, there is no rehabilitation for you. There isn't. And at least my belief. And the same thing here with child predator. And the, the sad part of this, too, is that, you know, you see the right wing going crazy with their, their um, and not all the right wing, with the extreme right wing, I guess I'm trying to say, going crazy with their Pizzagate conspiracies, going crazy with their, you know, uh, Democrats drinking the blood of children and child pedophilia. And certainly we've seen a number of people on the right um, be accused and be convicted of child pornography. Priests who are more often than not lean towards the right point of view, uh, molesting adult uh, altar boys and what have you. So no one owns that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it occurs... In all walks of life. I just think it's horrific to see it happening in a situation like this. Under the watch of a guy who created these wonderful shows. And that's what makes it such a colossal mindfuck. And a number of the actors spoke about this. That, you know, they wanted to speak out. But were afraid to speak out. Because Dan ran, according to them, a toxic set. Where all of his desires were met and his anger could cause you to lose your job, to be on a, a show less, to eventually get moved off the show. Um, and that everyone was trying to curry favor. In essence, it's a mini cult, right? This is people need to understand the cult stuff is not just a dude sitting with long hair in the middle of a barn and everyone is doing crazy stuff and working for each other and whatever. No, a cult cults can appear everywhere. And the cult of personality is massive, you know? And if one person is in charge of everyone else's happiness, that's a cult of personality. 
No. If you have an abusive father or mother who domineers the household, that is a cult of personality. If you have to walk on eggshells around a certain person who is in charge of a group, that's a cult of personality. You're in a cult, okay? And you are you live to serve the cult leader and to make him happy. Uh, and that's what you see when you watch this show, is that he was essentially a cult leader with all these young children, uh, young actors, um, and their parents, whose money he was providing, whose life uh, he was providing them, uh, in essence, catering to him and all his whims. Um, and it was really unsettling to see that. Now, Dan Schneider denies hiring Brian Peck, said he had nothing to do with hiring Brian Peck. But in the story here, to me, as we hear Drake talk about what he experienced at the hands of Brian Peck, and that he says that Dan was the only person who reached out. Dan was the only person who was there for him during this time. You have to wonder because Brian Peck was finding, uh, was able to, to find out all these things about Drake Bell and essentially hunt him down and be able to show up at his uh, concerts and follow him around to his shows. And I don't mean onset shows. I mean, uh, uh, musician shows. You have to wonder after he told uh, Dan and Dan was supposedly so kind in the uh, taking care of Drake. Did he, in a way, push or tell uh, Brian Peck what was going on, you know, to kind of put him in a position? Because what you find out in the show is that all of these people wrote these incredible letters of support for Brian Peck after he was accused by Drake Bell of sexually abusing and molesting him. Um. And all these people wrote letters of support, including James Marsden, Taryn Killam from SNL, if you guys remember him, Alan Thicke, Thomas DeSanto, who's an ex- is a producer on the X-Men, Ryder Strong, Will Friedel, and even Joanna Kearns all wrote letters of support for Brian Peck while he was accused of sexually abusing a minor. They wrote letters of some saying he even some of these letters said that he must have been tempted to do it. That must something must have happened to him to make him do this to this young man. Rather than speaking with this young man, speaking with his family, finding a way or waiting for the evidence to come out in court, they wrote letters of support for this person. Now, Joanna Kearns, to her credit, took it back and said, had I known what was going on? I was giving the given the wrong information. Had I known, I would have never wrote the letter. Will Friedel has walked it back on his podcast that he has. And I know Will. I've worked with Will on a couple of uh, Transformers shows. Really nice guy, Will. Um, and so all credit to him to walk walking it back. Um, a, a number of other people have not come out to walk it back or, or kind of defend themselves in the situation. But it seems like it was pretty clear that... Um, they were told certain things. And that's what I'm getting at. I feel like maybe, in my mind, analyzing this, Dan Schneider told a bunch of these people, because Brian Peck was a friend of Dan's. He was on the show, The Pickle Boy, that old nonsense. You saw that in the documentary. It might have been Dan Schneider who was getting all the information about what was going on and then told these people to write these letters of support for Brian Peck. Um to help defend. He might have played both sides. And I, I wouldn't be surprised because he's he's described throughout the series as a double, a person with a double personality who could be very kind and warm and over the top uh, complimentary and then turn on a dime and become this evil, horrific, um, domineering and toxic, aggressive and violent person. So you see that throughout. So, um, this entire series is just full of these stories that if you're a nineties kid, I think will devastate you um, and uh, fuck you up, you know, knowing that this guy had this much access that these parents were so caught up with what is going on here. I'm sorry. I put the wrong one up that these parents were so caught up uh, with this situation that um, they allowed this to happen, you know? Uh, so, just 
Hard stuff to watch. Really hard stuff to watch. And I know there are some parents who didn't know this was going on. But when you watch the Amanda Bynes section of the show, it certainly feels like her dad was very involved in commodifying her initially. And certainly, I think maybe once they saw what the after effects were and her wanting to get emancipation from them, I think they both realized, her dad and her mom, that this was a much more grave situation than they anticipated. And Dan Schneider got involved to try to essentially move Amanda away from her parents. Dan Schneider felt it was his right to try to help this young actress that he found as a teenager to emancipate herself from her parents. Why? Because he has financial gain from it. So this just really is a tough watch to know that this man had so much of an effect to make so many of these people famous and so many of these people part of our, um, how can I say this, our fame vocabulary, like we know their names, we've seen their shows, we've seen their work, we've seen their projects, yet he's also the same guy who was in charge of a toxic set, created a, a toxic environment, um, ordered himself to have massages by numerous female crew members, um, hold, held their future in his hands, and would lord it over them however he wanted. There's a couple of moments in the series where you see him coming up behind Jeanette McCurdy and scaring her for her own. But this is a grown-ass man. You know, as uh, Cedric the Entertainer once said in Kings of the Comedy, you a grown-ass man, dog. You a grown-ass man, dog. And this costumer who is there as an um, anonymous person who worked on a number of the shows, she said that this is something that he did, that he just indulged in these things. Um, and there were uh, his own personal videos that he took coming up behind people, his young actresses, and messing with them, trying to scare them. And this costumer suggested that Dan was stuck in a state of arrested development. And that's why he was able to do such great kids TV because he was still stuck kind of mentally as a teenager. And this is where we get into the um, psychiatry of it all and the fucked up philosophy, messed up brain of it all. Uh, Cause it does sound from what we've seen in the four, what we see in those four episodes that he is in a state of arrested development. He still thinks he's a kid. He still thinks he's a teenager and he's that, you know, bowl haircut, overweight teen who never, who the girls never spoke to. And he's living this fantasy out of the girls that he found attractive when he was a teenager with some of the girls he was selecting to be actresses for his shows. And there's, uh, in the series, you see them talking about how they want, he wanted them to be costumed. You know, he denies that he didn't input on the, which is, of course, utter horseshit. But costume, he's the one that decided like how they looked and what they wore and short skirts and what have you. And so you see that. Um, also, some of the things that Ariana Grande did in their her web series within her show there with Jeanette McCurdy, where uh, she is spraying water on herself while she's lying on her back, where she's messing with a potato, asking it for its juice as if it might be a penis. Like, there's so much unsettling stuff that he was indulging in his sophomoric humor in. And then we get to the two female writers, and that's the first episode. We get to know the two female writers, Christy Stratton and Jenny Kilgan, who worked for him uh, and got onto the Amanda show. And he fucked them over by hiring them to work under one salary. That means they both had to split one salary. And I think it's Jenny who says later, but when she came back for season two, uh, because Christy did not come back for season one. They they fired her. Um, but Jenny came back for season two, lasted four days after Dan accused her of working for a phone sex line in a room full of the male writers. And had also hired a white male writer with way less experience at a full salary rate to be a writer on the show. And this is the thing at the end. At least, and, and now I'm getting Now I've given you the, the, the background of all this. This is where the anger lies for me, is that We've created too much of an environment here in Hollywood where, or there in Hollywood where these motherfuckers can come in and create their fucking fantasy lands and then abuse everybody that works for them. And there is no repercussion. 
Like there is no repercussion. Oh, he got $7 million. That's what they reported in the series to end his contract when Nickelodeon got rid of him in 2018. No, he hasn't, he hasn't done shit since. He keeps saying he wants to make a comeback. Motherfucker, take your money, shut the fuck up, and go away. That's what should happen. No one should give him another opportunity to work in this business. After you watch the series, after you read some of these things Jeanette wrote, uh, uh, other people have written about him and the experiences with him, he shouldn't be allowed anywhere near this business again. And Hollywood needs to police itself. Enough is enough already. If you can't put these motherfuckers in jail for the rest of their lives, you at least need to put them in Hollywood jail, which means no one ever works with you ever again. You either invest wisely and you can live off that money you made, those ill-gotten gains, or you go and find a new job. And this is where, I, to me, it gets so frustrating when you see this stuff because he essentially got away with all of running a toxic environment. Uh, there's a story that Christy... Str she doesn't tell the story, but uh, Jenny Kilgut, I think, tells a story that he made Christy Stratton pitch a high school story for an episode of the series. This is a first year writer. This is her first year being a, a staff writer. He made her pitch it lying across his desk, pretending to be sodomized. What the fuck is wrong with your mind? If you think that's funny. And this is the frustrating part. When I watch this stuff is the in we're watching a bunch of men in charge of this shit, indulging their dicks indulging their worser sexual proclivities because they think they can. And in a system that allowed them to do that. Now, I hope those days are over. I hope the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter and so many other movements recently have finally killed this. You know, and they're almost always white. Now, that could also be because they almost always were white showrunners or predominantly white showrunners, but... It's a bunch of white men who seriously indulge their the uglier sides of their nature to go after these uh, young actresses or young actors and prey on their, their minds and prey on their emotions and take the benefit of it and make money off of them. And then when they have female writers, this is the kind of way they look at them. I mean, they both say that he said women aren't funny. They're not funny. They can't write funny. And then he said, do you mind if I refer to you two as the girls? And they both said no, and he said good, because I hate when people are uptight about it. That's what they claim. And yes, you know, writers' rooms, sure, they're going to at times be, you know, going to pitch jokes, whatever. I'm sure there are writers. I'm sure Tina Fey ran writers' rooms where they were pitching some dirty-ass jokes. That's part of comedy. That's why they think they're funny, because they can tell dirty jokes. But there are things where it goes too far, Right. Uh, Christy Stratton talks about the fact that uh, during her year working there, he offered to pay her $300 to eat two, I think, two things of ice cream. She did it, and then he never paid her. And when he called, when she called him out on it, he got so upset, he took her into the office and, and dressed her down verbally. Um, yeah, he'd get massages in the writer's room, and then he blackmailed, blackmailed them by playfully saying, oh, I... Uh, you know, if you don't if you don't massage me, your sketch is not going to be in the show. This is the kind of sad ass shit that you see from a man child who never grew the fuck up and who was willing to abuse people at his own uh, with his own desires. Um. Eventually, Jenny Kilgan uh, went to the Writers Guild after she left the show. Where, after that moment where he accused her of working for a phone sex line, which she never did. Um, and got the WGA involved, and they sued Dan Schneider. And Dan thought that she had done it, and she never claimed that she did, even though she did do it. And Dan threatened her, according to her, threatened her uh, that she would never work again for Nickelodeon again. He black he blackball her, um, and all of this stuff. So it was uh, rough to watch. You know, watching the worser parts of a person in charge of these situations um, is madness. Yeah, and this is a great point. Charles brings up Charles' movie channel. Those days aren't over. The abusers just got better at covering it via NDAs. Yeah, NDAs need to stop. NDAs need to be over. No more fucking NDAs. Fuck that. Fuck that. Unless it's about protecting content, then okay. That's I understand that because that's that's copyrighted content or intellectual property. Totally understand that. 
But behavior-wise, fuck that. No NDA should cover. You can't talk about it. I've I've spoken about this already. You know when they when they let me go from Collider four years ago, they held my severance check over my head, put it on a carrot or like a carrot on a stick, and said, "You won't get these whopping two thousand dollars unless you sign an NDA where you don't say anything negative about Mark Fernandez or about Collider." And I calmly told them to kiss my fucking ass. I never took their money. I never signed that NDA so I could have the freedom to say what the fuck I want about anything and about my shitty ass experiences working for Collider under Mark Fernandez. But I did that, right? I have a right to do that. And I think NDAs that try to tell you to not talk about your experiences working with certain people or working under companies or working under the auspices, I think all that shit should be tossed in the fucking trash. There should never be an NDA that covers that. Intellectual property, yes. You know, uh, content you create under their uh, employ, absolutely. But NDA is telling you you can't talk about the toxic, aggressive, um, verbally abusive, possibly sexually assaulting, uh, or sexually embarrassing situations. Nonsense. Fucking nonsense. They should all be tossed out by the Supreme Court in some kind of ruling so that they, no company can ever put those kinds of NDAs on a person. Because you've got a right to speak your mind if you've been abused, and you've got a right to speak your mind publicly so that other people don't have to work in those situations. So just my two cents. Just uh, giving you my two cents on the whole situation. <sighs> all right, well, I've gone on for like, what, 45 minutes straight, which I'm sure it's not new for some of you all <laughs> that I can talk. Um, and I see that I, I just looked up and saw how many people are watching, 150 people watching. Thank you so much. For those of you who um, uh, were okay with my graphic, having another show on there, thank you for not calling me out on that. Uh, I just switched it over here because I was stupid and didn't pay attention. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, Tony <laughs> Tony Peluso says uh, SCOTUS would never rule in favor of labor. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I, I, I don't know. It's gonna... well, okay, 42 minutes straight talking about it. Jesus, I only thought I was going to do like half an hour on this. So, um, yeah, this is the thing. Let I, I, I see, I'm looking through some of y'all's comments, um, and, I, and I appreciate you guys saying all this stuff. Um, yeah, if you guys haven't watched the show, uh, or I'm sorry, if you haven't watched the series, you really should watch the series. Um, yeah, CTB sh saying Taron Killam was Drake's friend, Drake Bell's friend. Which, yeah, it's a, a shame. Um, somebody mentioned that Ryder Strong walked it back. I didn't see that, so thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, uh, always. Um, oh, also Josh Peck, who some people had accused... Because apparently Josh and Drake have had issues. I didn't know that, but Josh and Drake apparently have had issues for a number of, ye a number of years. Uh, but apparently um, Josh Peck posted something on TikTok that made it seem as if, you know, fuck you if we, we haven't spoken in a long time, which a lot of people thought he was maybe saying this to Drake. But then Josh Peck came out on his Instagram and said very clearly that he supports uh, Drake Bell and he was horrified by what he saw in the series and that he's having a tough time processing it. But he sends him all his support, and he sends anyone who's experienced this kind of stuff all his support as well. So, Fred says, "Yeah, if you don't, if network studios don't want their dirty laundry aired, then wash it." Roca, I love your passion. Yeah, I agree. I appreciate that. Um, uh, and then Yes Boy says, uh, "This reminded me of the recent Vince lawsuit. As a kid growing up watching these shows, a lot of questionable stuff got aired. Uh, image behind the scenes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah." Yeah, Drake said that Josh talked to him in private. Yes, absolutely. Drake did say that. Yes. So, um, and Jeremy asked, did you see the thing where the where the Neds classified joke where they made fun of Drake's abuse? No, I didn't. What is that? Neds, I don't know what Neds classified joke is. I don't know what that is. So, no. Double Toast's take was smart. Do what's it's worth watching. Their video. Oh, great. Thanks, JG. So, don't watch me, I guess, because I'm not... Uh, smart or nuanced on all of this. Um, sorry, JG. I, I like to think I'm smart. Um, I like to think I'm nuanced when it when it calls for it, but if I'm not, then I apologize, buddy. Uh, Josh did an interview with THR yesterday addressing, but he's been he's been awful behind the scenes. 
Um, you mean Drake Bell or Josh? I know Drake has had issues, and they spoke about it on the series. Like the series is very honest about Drake. Um, he is saying that how Drake, um, you know, we, we, they talk about in the series how Drake uh, got into some stuff and uh, was accused of sending inappropriate texts to uh, uh, girls who were minors. And so uh, I can't speak on any of that because I didn't see any of that. But uh, he says he took responsibility for all of it. So I don't know uh, what the extent of all that is. Um, yeah, but this was a very tough show to watch. And you got to put it in context, I guess. You have to put it in context because, you know, you don't want to get mad at the parents. You don't want you can't get mad at these kids or these parents because I believe they all did find a moment or most found a moment, I would have to believe, to say something. And then as we saw from a number of people in the series when they tried to speak up, were were shut down or shut up or told or made to feel like they were messing with other people's money um, or endangering their livelihoods or destroying the dreams of these young actors who just wanted to make it in Hollywood. Um, so that was a that's something that I'm I was watching was uh make sure make, I want to make sure we stressed the Amanda Bynes stuff is a really tough watch as well because of course what has happened with Amanda with the breakdown I'm telling you. That's the most heartbreaking. I mean, obviously, Drake's is the most devastating, but I think the Amanda story is the one that is the most heartbreaking for me because I have only kind of peripherally knew Amanda, and it's only recently that I've, like, stumbled upon films that she's been in, like, uh, was that version of She's the Man that they did, and is that the one or the one that's like where she's playing a boy and she's playing her brother in essence. And I think it's based on a Shakespeare play with uh, Channing Tatum and she's really good in that. Um, and there's a couple other ones that I've recently watched just like an hour of or half an hour of because I'm flipping around channels. I'm like, Oh yeah, I remember her and whatever, but I didn't know she was like a stand up comic at 10 years old or 12 years old. And then I didn't know she had her own show and uh, you know, came on all that. And then the Amanda show I had no idea about anything that's on, on any of this Amanda by. So watching her grow up as the series goes along, you're watching an incredibly gifted, naturally talented person from a young age who knew how talented she was. And watching what happens to her as the series goes along, and then, of course, what happened to her afterwards and the break, the mental breakdowns and her parents had to be her uh, had to be uh, her conservators for a number of years before she finally got out of that situation, and she's now just you know kind of trying to put her life back together. And if you watch those videos, she doesn't want you to feel sorry for her. So there's still that steel of Amanda Bynes within her, but you can't help but think about like what if she hadn't been in this situation, and how many of these kids are damaged or broken from being involved in this stuff, right? Jamie Lynn Spears, Jeanette McCurdy certainly experienced some stuff. I don't know where, what Victoria Justice is, is condition is, or there have been some accusations on Ariana Grande that she likes to be carried everywhere like she's a child. So, I mean, it, it can be a quite a dip. And of course, Drake and the substance abuse and the drug abuse and all of that, that happens there. So there's a number of people involved in this Dan Schneider universe who came out of it pretty pretty damaged and pretty hurt. Um, and some of them overcame it and some of them are still kind of still navigating it, you know? And so it just breaks my heart. Cause Amanda, I think Amanda could have moved into like Sandra Bullock territory or Meg Ryan territory from back in the eighties, where she could have, as she got older as a woman really started leading some interesting rom-coms or, maybe a, a few series on TV. There was certainly a very big future for Amanda. And uh, sadly, the mental break, you know, is where we're at. And of course, wishing her nothing but um, goodwill and, and, and strong mental health and that she, you know, navigates her pain as best as she can. But it's certainly sad to see that the end result was that, you know, and, and what have you, you know. Uh Chris says, what's crazy is that we're only a few episodes into this docu-series, uh, for sure. Um, but it's done. It's only four episodes, I think, right? I mean, I, you're saying we're only a few episodes in, but I think it's only, I think it's done. Um, but let me see if there's more, because if there's more, I will absolutely come back and do like a, a full season wrap-up. But I think there's only four episodes. I watched all four. Let's see here. 
Uh, yeah, there's only four. It doesn't list any more episodes. So I think this is it, my man. So we are done with the show. Um, and there's quite a number of other people who I didn't mention who are in this, uh, like Giovanni Samuels. Giovanni Samuels, she speaks about her experiences as well, being on this. Leon Frierson speaks about his experiences. Kyle Sullivan speaks about dealing with Brian Peck. He went over to Brian Peck's house, and Brian Peck had had a pen pal relationship with John Wayne Gacy, the fucking guy who dressed up as a clown to abuse children, sexually abuse children, and the ser- he was a serial killer, and he showed these letters to Kyle Sullivan, for fuck's sake, um, as a young kid, a young adult. Um, so it's madness. And then when they found the journals for Brian Packett, he is talking about wanting to rape children and wanting to do these terrible things. And then han- you see the, the handy guy, they talk about him and all the stuff they found out about him. It's pretty tough. And then there was apparently a freelancer who brought a child on to the Nickelodeon lot just to abuse the child at Nickelodeon. Probably uh, tricked the child that he was taking him to Nickelodeon just so he could sexually abuse him. It's horrific. And Nickelodeon, to their credit, changed their policies so they they do background checks on freelancers, but still. It's pretty heartbreaking, you know. Katrina Johnson was a part of this as well. Spoke about it um, in depth on her experiences. Uh, there on sets uh, while she was growing up. Because she was kind of the Amanda Bynes before Amanda Bynes, and that was a part of that, too. And then Mark Summers, who hosted Double Dare. We barely got anything with him, though, so I was pretty surprised by that. I thought there would be much more with Mark Summers. I think the other side of this that was really... I wish the series had gotten all those actors to come out and talk about their experiences with Dan Schneider. And I wonder why. You know, Kenan Thompson... Victoria Justice, Jeanette McCurdy, Ariana Grande, and a number of other these, another one, Jamie Lynn Spears. A number, a lot of these actors don't come on camera to talk about their experiences there. Maybe, you know, Dan is still maybe a strong presence in Hollywood. Maybe these people want to keep working. Maybe Dan has a number of friends in Hollywood, so they don't want to mess that up. You know, I don't care, so I don't mind talking about this stuff, but maybe it's about career, you know, saving their career. And then maybe they don't want to. Relive it. That's possible too, because Drake Drake was struggling to talk about it, even though he wanted to. He showed the bravery to step forward and speak about it. It was still tough to watch um, throughout the series, for sure. So, um, all right. Well, let's take a quick break, y'all. Um, uh, I think there's uh, anyone get Zendaya? No, Zendaya. I don't think I said anything either. So, and, and the sh- yeah, as I said, the shitty thing about. Brian Peck is that he kept working after he left. So I, I wonder in the at the end of the day where where it all what it all leads to. And I wonder what it's going to take for us as a society to pass much harsher laws when it comes to these kinds of assaults, especially with children. You know, and look, I'm not trying to be no crazy right winger, pizza gate, none of that nonsense. I'm trying to be a human being. And for me, the sexual abuse of a child is a massive murder of a child's formative years and especially with drake speaking about how that happened multiple times it caused him an incredible amount of pain and and sadness and and this is while he was doing it right before he's about to do that sitcom that he did with josh beck so like there's so much going on and here he was suffering through all of this um it's just painful absolutely painful to to see that all going down so um all right uh let's uh let's take a quick break um uh, and on the other side we are going to answer any stream labs that have come through you guys uh, see the uh address there on the graphic i didn't pin it in the chat because i just wanted to kind of get into things and after the uh issue with the camera i didn't want to um uh, miss out on starting so um if you've sent any stream labs i'll answer them after the break and then we'll watch this interview uh interview with uh, Dan Schneider here uh, on the other side here. And we'll be right back uh, right after this. Oops. 
All right. Here we go. All right, we're back. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me. Please make sure you subscribe to the channel down below. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell button. So see, we're dropping all the content we do here on the Outlaw Nation channel. And I want to make it clear again, these are all allegations that were brought about by people on the series. I am in no way saying that Dan Schneider did all this. I am giving my opinion, my analysis, my point of view. Um, and I am making it clear that it is all these people who are in the series who are accusing Dan Schneider of this. But I will call him out, of course, where I think if the accusations were true, what my opinions are about that. And that's what I've done here throughout the majority of the show. Fantastic said, as a parent who had athletic sons, I was very aware of those coaches who were abusive and demeaning to kids and wanted my boys nowhere near them. No matter how their program could help them, there are other non-toxic ways. Yeah, it's a, it's a great thing you bring up there, um, Fred, because uh, that's something that Drake Bell's dad said he noticed early on with Brian Peck's behavior around his son that he was like finding excuses to touch him to stroke his arm to help him put on clothes for his sketches and things of that nature over the scenes um and he alarm bells went off in his head and so he was the one that went and confronted i think he said he confronted dan and other people about the discomfort he felt um from the behavior of brian peck towards his son so that is an element of the show but I hear you, Fred. I mean, I, I I am very happy I don't have children. Not because I don't I didn't want to have children, more like I think I'd be a fucking hell on earth person around like from anybody fucking with my children. Like I'd yeah. Like I I, I if I found out Brian Peck had abused my son, Brian Peck would be no more. I mean it's as simple as that. It's simple. I gladly do the time. Simple I gladly do the time. Um, if you were to, if I found out you sexually abused my child, and I'm not passing judgment on Drake Bell's father, that's his own uh, way of living his life, and I, I think he he broke me in half. I started crying watching his response when he was finally told because you know Drake told him in the series, but doesn't tell him that it's him, and then later they ask him what his reaction was when he found out that it was Drake, and uh, that's a pain no father should experience, which he says, you know, and so was heartbreaking to watch to see that uh, from uh, from him for sure um all right uh, yeah i would be a beast amber that's for sure i would absolutely uh i don't know i don't know if i can say it on the on the on live but yeah i would i just brian, brian peck would be no more simple as that simple as that simple as that yeah, that's, that's basically that because again i believe that is murder and uh, i think that's what they've done to children when they abuse them in that manner it's horrific and the fact that Brian Peck still gets to kind of just, you know, hang out in Los Angeles, I, it's kind of mind-blowing to me because it says to me that he still wants to find a way back in. And that's unsettling. Uh, Mariana Barbara says, uh, watching the doc made me sick. I agree. Corey Feldman screamed about this abuse and pedophilia in Hollywood for years and no one listened. What will it take for them to learn and fix the system? Well, uh, Mariana, as I said earlier, I hope they fix the system. I hope they've fixed the system now. I think young actors have much more agency now. I think things have changed. So social media changed that, I think, as well. I think, you know, for all the complaints people have about social media, social media has also made it possible to call out people en masse with one post uh, and cause a massive change um, in the system. So, And you're right. Corey Feldman spoke about it for years. But Corey also had issues, right? And uh, Corey Haim as well. Um, and sadly, you know, Corey's no, Corey Ham's no longer with us, Corey Feldman, and all of that uh, stuff that went down with Corey Feldman was, you know, very true. And I think people didn't listen to him because Corey comes off as a bit kind of unstable. But then when you put it in context, he's unstable because of the sexual abuse he endured as a young child actor, you know, and that again, it's a murder. It messes with your head. As we see Drake speak in the show, in the series, he got into drug abuse and alcohol abuse to hide from the pain. He said there was no therapy and uh, no one from Nickelodeon reached out to him to try to get him any kind of services according to him or any kind of help in dealing with this. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a rough situation. Um, 
PC says, how can you fix something that's always been broken? Uh, I think you get better people in charge who are willing to call this shit out, aren't afraid, who are willing to get strong, powerful lawyers to destroy people like this who do this kind of stuff. I think that's how you fix a broken system, is that you get different people in charge who are going to um, handle the situation uh, and make sure those people pay for their crimes uh, legally. You know, I, I think it's how you do it. And you got to get people... Because listen, this is these are... I don't know. I don't think this is rampant across the system, right? But the fact that it happens once is too much. The fact that it happens this many times is almost mind-boggling and should be stopped. So I'm hoping that things have changed. Uh, and I hope people are more afraid to get found out for this stuff. Um, but the way to do that is to punish the people who they do find out about it in the worst ways possible in terms of taking away their livelihood and what have you. Um, let's see if there's anything else I missed on any of this that I want to make sure we talk about. Du -du 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 -du. No, I think that was all of it. Um, all right. So I think that's everything. So if you want to keep sending in Streamlabs and Super Chats, I would appreciate it. Let me pin the Streamlabs address in the chat. I forgot to do that to start the show. I should always do that before I uh, start a show, just in case anybody wants to send in support as we go along. We are going to watch the um, uh, the 19 minute interview here with Dan Schneider, uh, so I can go through it and show you the PR tricks that him and his team are doing to um, get people to be on his side, to get himself back as employable in Hollywood. Um, I think that's a massive part of this um, uh, interview, um, and. Just to give you a little background, I, I think I I didn't write this down, so I'm going to um, give you a little background on this real quick. Um, Dan Schneider was interviewed. This is on his YouTube channel. What we're about to watch here. Let me bring it up so we can look at it at the same time. Uh, where is it here? Oh, where did I put it? Sorry, guys. Uh, I put it here. Okay, okay, there it is. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure I put it where I could get to it. Da, 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 here it is. So we're going to make it big so we can watch it together. Um, oh, make me a little bit bigger than that. There we go. So we're going to watch this together. Uh, and he is being interviewed here on his YouTube channel conducted by Boog, exclamation point E, Boog E, I guess, who played Tebow on iCarly. And he's addressing uh, some of these allegations that he got um, throughout the series and gi giving his point of view on them. So we're going to watch it and uh, give our analysis. Let me adjust my chair so I'm a little more higher up here. All right, there we go. All right, uh, Cowboys fan 92 says, Hi, Roka, love and respect your brother. That shit's crazy as a 90s kid. Roka, I respect you always have since the Collider days. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, Cowboys fan. Angel says, uh, Angel Gabriel says, I've never donated before, John. I appreciate your thoughts on this matter and on movies in general. Keep doing your thing, man. Thank you, Angel. I appreciate that. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you, everybody's hanging out with me here on a Friday night. You could be anywhere. You could be out on a date. You could be hanging out watching the NCAA tournament or watching a movie or a TV show. But I appreciate the 150 of you who are hanging out with me right now to watch this. Uh, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that bell button so see when we're dropping all the content uh, here. And keep sending in your Streamlabs and Super Chats. Certainly, some of you will have stuff to say as we watch this interview. But I will pause it as I watch it to give my two cents on it. So just want to make sure that's clear before we start this off. I think it's, what's the way to watch it like this or like this? I think it's the be best, right? Cause I'm too small here. So I want to make sure I wish uh stream lab. Oh, maybe I could do it like it. No, no, no. I'm too small there. And that's too big. I wish they had a way to do this so that it was a little bit bigger and I was a little bit smaller, but this is the situation. So let's uh, turn the sound up and let's watch this interview. 19 minutes and 25 seconds. And I'll try to not pause it too much and only talk through certain moments. So here we go. Hey, it's Boogie. I play T-Bow on Nickelodeon's iCarly. What is Boogie? I got a chance to watch the Quiet On Set program, and I reached out to Dan to see if it was something that he'd be willing to discuss. I'm pleased to say that he said yes. Dan, how are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, I really appreciate you reaching out and giving me the opportunity to talk. All right. Now let's stop for a second. First of all, 
Do you really believe he reached out to Dan and said, hey, why don't you come on here and let's talk about it? Do you really believe that? I don't know what's the truth. I, I don't know that he did necessarily. I think maybe he's got a good, strong relationship with Dan. He reached out to him and said, let's do something here. I want to protect you. You helped me out. Dan says, yes, absolutely. This helps me out. But look where they set this. I want to make it very clear. I'm actually going to make this bigger for right now. Oh, sorry. Uh, look how they set this thing, right? First of all, very warm tones. You know, you've got the one singular plant there in the middle. These are a lot of um, um, cream colors, cafe colors, very warm. The background is very warm as well. You've got this uh, old school bicycle in the back there. Uh, and when we go on, we'll see what Dan is. Dan's wearing very muted colors as well. Boogie is standing out. It's very stylish. Respect to Boogie's uh costumer and his style and fashion but everything is very soft and warm and safe and inviting so already this is manipulative as fuck the fact that boogie is not a journalist is even more manipulative in the situation here and there's no way dan would have agreed to a journalist um interviewing him like, like this because he'd have gotten his ass smoked uh, the fact that it's boogie who seems pretty partial to dan Right from the beginning with a smile on his face and really appreciate you being on here. Motherfucker, this guy ran a toxic, aggressive, um, horrible environment, according to everybody on the show. And you're like, hey, thanks for being here. It's cool. Thanks so much for stopping by. Like, what in the fuck is wrong with you? But let's keep watching this uh, interview and um, and go forward here. Talk to you about uh, what we saw over the last two nights. I'm really glad you're here because I believe this is important. For sure. Uh, we've got a lot of things to unpack. Um, but before I dive into my list of topics that I'd like to discuss, is there anything you'd like to start off? All right, so with? Absolutely. Okay. Watching over the past two nights. See how setup is? Is there anything you want to say? So let me, let me, as the good looking black man with style and fashion, and of course, remember some of the accusations were that he was racist or the black actors on the show. So let's get a black actor to conduct this interview. This will be great. Um, and he tees him up to deliver this statement. That's right out. It's textbook 101 PR. Like you come out with a statement first. I'm not going to grill you on all of this. Let's have yet. Let's have you come out with a statement. So if anybody's watching it, they can immediately be like, Oh, I, I think I might see his point of view or, Oh, I might be a little bit softer towards him because he's really contrite or whatever. So I think that's what we're going to see here. It was very difficult me facing my past behaviors. Um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret. And I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. Let's talk about the massage. Why haven't you done the apologies already? Why haven't you reached out to people? Uh, like, um, oh God, who are the actress's name here? Sorry, I'm going to bring her name up here. Um, uh, yeah, her la uh, oh, where is she? Sorry, gang. Uh, one of the actresses who spoke very strong, uh, Alexa Nicholas. She says in addressing this interview and this apology, attempt to buy Snyder uh, that I know everyone deals with their emotions in their own way, but I don't feel anything from you, Dan. I don't feel a thing. And she said she would have preferred a private apology. And that's how you do it. This is brand saving what Dan Schneider is doing here. This is brand saving 101. This is, I still want to work in Hollywood. So I'm going to publicly apologize rather than actually personally go to each person that I've, he said, I owe a lot of people an apology. I bet he hasn't reached out to one fucking person to apologize to them, but he says he owes them an apology because that makes the general public be like, oh, see, he is contrite. He does want to make amends, but it's, it's all for show. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Yeah, interesting. Dan, talk to me about the writer's room. From what I saw, not cool. No, no. And God, the way it's set up is so, I mean, what is he doing, right? Like, come on. What I saw, not cool, man. What are you doing? What are you doing, man? You're saying not cool, like, oh, man, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have stole that, uh, shouldn't have stole that burger at lunch, man. Not cool. This is a much more weightier subject. And to present it in such a soft, 
approach, I think is massively frustrating here. And I, I don't mean to cut you off, but if I can cut right to the chase, let me just say, no writer should ever feel uncomfortable in any writer's room ever, period, the end, no excuses. Um, most TV writers, comedy writers have been in writer's rooms and they are aware that a lot of times there are inappropriate jokes made and inappropriate topics come up. Uh, but the fact that I participated in that, especially when I was leading the room, um, it embarrasses me. I shouldn't have done it. Um, and, and I can tell you why it hurts really bad for me. Um, I remember very clearly my early experiences, my first experiences in the entertainment business. I was green. I was scared. I was excited. It, it meant the world to me that I was getting those opportunities. And I went in and I got lucky because they were great. My first couple of experiences were fantastic. And the fact that and the fact that I didn't pay that forward to every employee that walked through my door, yeah. it, it, it hurts my heart because I should have. And I wish I could go back and fix that. Um, in the writer's room, there's no doubt that sometimes those jokes went beyond the pale. And I said things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far. And um, that was wrong. And that, that was because, you know, I was an inexperienced producer. I was immature. Wouldn't happen today. But um I'm just really sorry it happened. So let's break down what he just said here. This is really important to break down what he said here and, and uh, solidify what he's exactly saying. Right off the bat, he's saying, hey, writers' rooms are like this. So, you know, they have, they they say inappropriate things. They they do certain things that certain jokes get told that shouldn't get told because of one thing or another. But, you know, but I get it. I, I shouldn't have done that, right? Already he's couching things subconsciously in your mind in that, there was nothing different that I did that other writers' rooms haven't done. So already he's trying to shave the edges off the um, uh, the, the I say I would say this the, the broken shard of glass that these accusations are that are sticking at him for what they accuse him of. And look, he can say all he wants right now. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm contrite. Blah blah blah. But clearly, when he was feeling himself, he was the lord of all he surveyed, and he did according to them on the show horrible things to them throughout the um in the writers room throughout the process horrible things you know telling women they aren't funny making a woman simulate sodomy while she tells a story to try to pitch it to be in the show having two women share a salary this is there are insulting things that are from him who he is as a person right none of that is being addressed He's saying the fan, the um, the general weak ass apology. Of, if everyone was offended, I apologize to everybody. I apologize. Shouldn't have been done. Shouldn't have been done. The way I did it, it shouldn't have been done. I had all these great advantages, and it didn't work out for me. Yeah, say you were an infantile, toxic little child, and you were caught up smelling your own shit, and you treated everybody like dog shit. Like fucking own up to it. That's the moment to own up to it. Blanket apologies, generalized apologies mean dog shit. Actual specificity in the apology is what matters. And there that isn't here. And that's why this is put upon, this feels fake. A lot of people have already said it feels fake when they watch it, and it doesn't make any sense. So let's keep going here. We want to backtrack to make sure. In the writer's room, there's no doubt that sometimes those jokes went beyond the pale, and I said things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far, and um, that was wrong. And that, that was because, you know, I was an inexperienced. Yeah, that's another thing. That's what a lot of these uh, abusers fall back on is, oh, I was inexperienced. I didn't know how to write a, uh, run a, write, write a writer's room. I, uh, I didn't know what it was like to produce anything. I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't know. And how come all those other producers who are first-time producers who run writer's rooms don't have a problem abusing their power, abusing their employees, abusing their female employees, but you did? You can't rely on experience. You can't fall back on an experience. What you need to fall back on is I had something fundamentally wrong with me as a human being because I did these things. And it had nothing to do with my fucking inexperience. It was all about the fact that I am damaged in some colossal ways emotionally and as a human being, which is why I did the things that I did. Producer, I was immature. Wouldn't happen today, but... Um, we don't know that I'm it wouldn't really happen. sorry it happened. Yeah. Now, we know you've had a lot of success over two decades. Thousands of... Now, see, he doesn't, he doesn't push back on him. He doesn't bring up the sodomy thing. He doesn't bring up anything. But what does he follow up with? Well, we know you had a lot of success. People have worked with you for you. Okay. Let's speak directly to the people who did not have a good experience with you. 
Okay, I would like to speak to those people because these are all setups, I man. Holy God! Anybody working, Boogie, with man. Have a good time. How can you look yourself in the you mirror? Me. Dog? You've been you on totally my used you. Um, Maybe you wanted to be. Look, I've had some know. employees that have worked for me for ten years, some more than twenty years, who would work with me again, but um, not everybody. There's a, still a significant number that didn't have a great time working for me. See, he, see, so my, see how he couches it. It starts off with all the people who would absolutely still work with him today. I want to get work. I still want to work. There are plenty of people who would still work with me today, despite the fact that I ran a toxic environment. But some people didn't. Let me address those. So batting average already couching really high in a softer in way. Um, and the way they wouldn't get the best of me is that I would let the pressure of doing 40 or even more episodes per year, I would let that pressure get to me, which a good boss should never, ever do. Are there specific things that you were doing? Sure. I would um, snap at people sometimes. Mm -hmm. I would be snarky when I could have given them a nicer answer. Um, I would not give people the time that they needed. I would be in too big a hurry to get on to the next thing I had to do. And watching that show, it made me, there were so many times I wanted to pick up a phone and call Why didn't those you? people and say, I'm so sorry. Why didn't and you? Let's talk about it. And I, I wish you'd had a better time. And I wish I could have shown you a better experience. Yeah. Now, You've written hundreds of episodes. Thousands of jokes have been told. Yeah. But currently where we are, uh -huh. some people think that some of those jokes are inappropriate for children. Now, see, Boogie saying this saying it this way is really important. He is saying some people feel this way that some of these jokes. Boogie, how do you feel, brother? How I know you're not a journalist, but you can offer your two cents on this and make it personal. What are your thoughts on this? Did you think these jokes were inappropriate? Saying some people already um, creates an othering. You're othering these people by saying that, right? Some people, the more sensitive, I'm not going to say the snowflakes, but the sensitive, that's essentially what you're implying by saying it this way, right? You didn't, you're not saying these, uh, there were a number of jokes that were relayed to us as we were watching the series that were, Really inappropriate, Dan. I mean, looking at it myself, I, found, I I was really disgusted by some of this stuff. Why did you think these were funny? That's the smarter move. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? All these jokes that you're speaking of. He didn't speak um, of any jokes. That the show covered over the past no specific nights, jokes. Every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny mm -hmm. and only funny. Okay? Um, now... We have some adults looking back at them 20 years later through their lens, and they're looking at them and they're saying, oh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for, for a kid's show. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem with that. If, if that's how anyone feels, let's cut those jokes out of the show, just like I would have done 20 years ago or 25 years ago. I cut it. I want my shows to be popular. I want everyone to like it. The more people who like the show is the happier I am. Yeah. So if there's anything in a show that needs to be cut because it's upsetting somebody, let's cut it. So I think it's big for you to say with your work, mm -hmm. if it's viewed as that today, you don't have a problem. <sighs> oh my God. Now I'm watching this for the first time. So I'm reacting in real time to this stuff. And <sighs> First of all, you can't cut all the jokes out of the show because the, it just would take too much manpower to do that kind of things. I say you take the shows down, but he's not going to say that because that affects his money. That affects his bottom line. He's not going to say that. Whereas when we had the Black Lives Matter situation, we heard about those 30 Rock episodes with the, with the Asian stereotypes and racism from Tina Fey and her writer's room. They took those shows down. They didn't cut the jokes out. They took them down. Um, I think a couple of things they might have cut the jokes out, but it, but most of them they took them down. I say you take all the shows down that have inappropriate jokes, all of them, every single episode. That's the real contriteness. And him saying I want people to enjoy my shows, he's essentially still saying like, yeah, I wrote some pretty inappropriate jokes, but 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 my shows are great. Please still watch them. Please still love them. You know. And then Boogie coming in with, boy, that's big of you. Whoa, that's incredible that you would do that. I tell you, that is fascinating. I think that is crazy, man. Uh, absolutely crazy to say that. Um, you know, oh, yeah, that's a, a wow. Wow. How big of you? Ridiculous. You're kissing the man's ass who is accused of all these things in the show that you claim to have just watched. Cut it. Cut it. I mean, that's a solution. The, the last thing I want to ever do yeah. is put any content in a show that's going to upset my audience and make them want to turn off the TV. Why would I ever want to do that? That makes sense. I want to give you an opportunity to kind of elaborate on something. Okay. 
the thought process from the series is you had the power to just write a joke and no matter what, it's going on TV. You just had that type of power. Is that true? The, the notion that I had the power to just produce whatever I wanted and have it air is completely false. Okay. Bullshit. Absolute fucking bullshit. Okay. There were many, many levels of scrutiny. Okay. So here, this is him passing the buck now. I can already tell where he's going. I haven't seen this interview, but I go tell he's going. He's already saying, all these people approved it. It wasn't just me. Why is everybody coming for me? All these other approved people could have stopped it, could have approved it. It's very clear from the show. For those of you who are sports fans and remember the old school coaches like Joe Paterno, Bobby Knight, these old school coaches who basically ruled the university. Yes, there were regents, there were university presidents, there were board members. But at the end of the day, the football coach or the basketball coach and like Pat Summit's um, or Gene Ariyama, they are for UConn, uh, in their uh, respective situations, have power over the whole university. In essence, he was making Nickelodeon money hand over fist with multiple shows. So the idea that there was some executive who could tell him, hey, don't do that joke, is nonsense. Utter fucking nonsense. And we hear in the show from the two female writers how when he came up with that name, the last name Taint there for the Amanda Bynes character that she had in one of those sketches, um, he told them to lie about what the implication of that word was rather than admit that it's because he was a sophomoric uh, ch man-child, snickering as he made a sex joke in a kid's show. Okay. We had executives in L.A., we had executives in New York. So two coasts. Two coasts. Okay. Uh, two uh, coasts. Approval. Whoa. Yes. And, and by the way, approval at every stage, really. Oh, okay. I'm talking about wardrobe. I'm talking about makeup. No one was sound because he was making dialogue, money. jokes, everything. No, when you find me that executive that was going to step forward and try to stop Dan and find me the Nicolo Nickelodeon board that was going to be like, you know what? This executive is right. We should kind of stop this stuff. And what we find out in the series is that even from the first show on, there were accusations of harassment, of um, of uh, of uh, abuse, and what have you, uh, from his part in his treatment of the people that worked for him, and because of the power that he wielded in those situations, and felt that he could get away with it. You say approval? Well, these obviously that's a hierarchy, not your colleagues right. or people in the room. Okay. No, no, not my colleagues. No, these are my bosses, bosses, and then their bosses, and then their bosses, and they're approving all of this. Bosses. Okay. okay? And we're also shooting it in front of all sorts of adults and caregivers and the set teacher and, and the families, everybody's watching it. And if it everybody who's watching it, who is, whose livelihood depends on these shows being successful, how many of them were going to step forward and cause an issue? Uh, you know, we had, um, we had one of the moms on the show. Uh, in, yeah. Her Tracy Hearn, she stepped forward and had an issue with it and she was ostracized. Um, Drake Bell's dad stepped forward and he was called a troublemaker and then eventually Brian Peck wheeled his way into that situation and got him removed from Drake Bell's life and being on set to call out the bullshit that was happening. So he was quite happy to get rid of these people who caused issues on sets. That's what it seems like from what I watched in the series and already from his answers here, he was quite happy to get rid of anybody who had issues with what he was doing. He was not some kind of person. See, I said, you can't say two things at the same time. You can't say, I apologize for the way I treated all these people. I apologize for the way I handled my sets and ran my sets and made everybody uncomfortable and made all these people feel the way that they felt. And then say, well, all of these people could have stopped me. All these people could have said something. All these people could have said, had an issue with it. Bullshit. You were clearly running a toxic a set that everyone was afraid to say a fucking word to you because you would uh, um, uh, fire their child or you would fire them from the production overall and affect the livelihoods of these people. So it's utter nonsense for him to talk out of both sides of his mouth that both those things were possible. It's nonsense. Anybody had said anything. Hey, we don't like that. That's not appropriate. You then, it would have been cut out. Lie. Now, utter lie. I'm going to push opinion. back a little bit sure. because... The series oh, you're gonna painted push, you in this okay way. I'm going to push back a little bit. That the fuck? You were just the guy that was doing what he wanted. And mm -hmm. people were afraid to confront you about things. So say, just humor me, say that that was the case. What would have been the ultimate way to... Okay. If nobody on the set, if all of the 
dozens and dozens of adults that were on the dozens side. and dozens. If they didn't say anything, if my bosses said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here, you got to cut that. I had to do it. I had no choice. Got it. But it's that's a lie. It's an utter lie. There is no way. And I wish, you know, another thing about this series, I wish we had gotten some interviews with, with Nickelodeon executives. I wish some of these had the stones to step forward and admit that they were part of this toxic and corrupt system that is alleged in the series and were uh, were complicit in allowing Dan to have this kind of power on set. This idea that a sole parent could step up, it is, there are numerous examples in the series that a number of parents tried to stop him from doing the things he was doing, and they were essentially shut down or pushed aside or pushed away, or their son's contracts weren't renewed. So this lie that he's telling, if any parent had any issue, he'd have changed, he'd have cut, is utter nonsense. And this idea that the people above him would have stopped him if if they thought it was inappropriate was, is just a falsity. This next one, levels. it kind of hit close to home. Mm -hmm. uh, being a new father, I wouldn't be opposed to, to my child being in the entertainment industry. Oof. It doesn't matter what age, yeah? Wow. Seeing some of those on air. Wouldn't be opposed to it at all. That's incredible, Boogie. Seeing it now? from where you are now in your life. What do you think of that? I think that some of the on-air dares went too far. Some. I think they pushed the envelope too far. Not all of them, not most of them, but some did. So he's still Nickelodeon defending wanted to do their version on -air of Fear Factor. At the time we were shooting all that, so I was tasked with doing these on-air dares with the All That cast. These are children, young adults that you're putting into these situations. The fact that you think that some, not all, is you, again, you're trying to couch it in that these are isolated incidences there's he's subconsciously trying to make this is all pr 101 he's talked to his people this is exactly how a predator talks um and i don't mean a sexual predator i mean a predator of people uh and their emotions he is essentially saying hey these i get that these but these were like you know essentially implying that these were isolated incidences and he wants to, he doesn't want to talk it all down because the more if he does admit to it all then they have even more reason to take his shows down. So we get with the writers the and we come money. up with all these ideas. And it's hard to do because we don't have the budget of fear factor. Sure. And we can't put the kids in dangerous situations like the adults are put in. So kids. it was hard to, yeah, hard to come up with stuff. But we would come up with all these ideas of dares they could oh, do. Oh, well. We would uh, so uh, give them to the network. And they would say, who one, is, uh, tell us the ones that were okay. Right? In here. Those are the ones we shot. Those are the ones that aired. At the time, I had no indication that any kid ever had a problem with them. But. When I was watching the show over the past two nights, I now know that there were kids who did have problems with the on-air dares. And it breaks my heart. And I'm so sorry. I am so sorry to any kid who ever had to do a dare or anything that they didn't want to do or weren't comfortable doing. We went out of our way to make sure they were safe and, and that everything was done properly. But if a kid was scared and didn't want to do it, kids shouldn't have had to do it. Yeah. Period. The end. Right. And if I had known at the time, I would, I would have changed it. You know how you know at the time? You ask the kid. Hey, be honest with me. Are you comfortable with this? We're going to do this. Be honest with me. Does this bother you? The kid is saying, oh, I can't remember the actor's name, but he is saying in the video as a kid saying, I'm uncomfortable with this. I don't like this. He's literally saying it in the video as these dogs lick peanut butter off his body, for God's sakes. So uh, to, for him to say like, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know, is absolute hogwash. Absolute hogwash. All right, let's keep going. On the spot. Now, we also saw the series highlight two former writers of yours, two women, mm -hmm. who spoke about a wage discrepancy. Now, I know that you don't divvy out salaries. Talk to me about that part. Well, you're correct. I have. How do you know that, Boogie? Boogie, how do you know he doesn't divvy out salaries? Most showrunners and creators and executive producers are very in tune with the budgets on their shows and who gets paid what. They insist on certain writers getting paid certain amounts. Yes, that happens. So, Boogie, what are you doing, man? And Dan agreeing is, again, another lie, in my opinion. Nothing to do with paying writers. I never have. I've never made a writer's deal. And of all the writers I've been in the writer's room with, I never even knew how much most of them were getting paid. Yeah, but we saw these two women who were writers for you sharing one salary. How mm -hmm. does that happen? It's very simple. There's a common practice in television when hiring writers. If you have a spot for a new writer, sometimes 
You'll go to two writers and say, hey, if you two new writers for your first job are willing to share a salary, you can both have the job. Mm. They have the opportunity to say, yes, that sounds good, or no, no thank you. In this case, it was two women writers. I've done another show where that teaming was done with two male writers, and they split a salary. I did another show where it was a male and a female writer, and they split a salary. So, And these are all first-time writers? All first-time writers looking for their first gig. Got it. Now in the series... Now there's no names being used. There's no show being cited. So we have no way to prove what he's saying. We have no way other than the guy who was the tox accused of being the toxic, aggressive, um, uh, self-indulgent, abusive, sexually inappropriate person, uh, both for children and women. Uh, we're supposed to believe him that he split the salary of two male writers for one show and a male and female writer on another show. Let's have names. Let's have shows. If you can't give me names, at least let's have shows. And some reporters will do the investigating and they'll start asking the questions. But he doesn't want to do that because they might find out that he's lying through his fucking teeth. They also highlighted two black actors who said that they felt overlooked. Now, I want to be clear. I'm never going to speak on anyone else's journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can talk about my experience, how my experience was with you, what I saw prior to working with you. But again, I don't want to speak on anyone's journey. I saw you be honored for diversity in your work. Yes. And the reason for that is diversity has always been very important to me in my shows. If you go back to the very first Nickelodeon show I ever made, that's very evident, as it is in the second one. And then the first movie I ever made for Nickelodeon, which starred Keenan and Kel. And every show I did after that had a lead black actor in it. I'm very proud of that. It's very important to me. And not only am I proud that they were in my shows, I'm exceptionally proud of the achievements they've had beyond my shows. And they've gone on to bigger and better things. And that gives me a great sense of pride. Well, something that really kind of bothered me was how they depicted your relationship with the cast. That's all we're doing with race? Just this one question and that's it? That's how you're representing the situation here as a black man? You're going to say, I had a great experience with you and I saw everything else, but talk to me about these people who brought this up. Oh, I have diversity. And he lines it up by saying, I saw you make diversity a big deal. He doesn't go into the specific accusations. He doesn't go into it with Dan and go, what do you think about what he said about this? What about what she said about this? What about the Girl Scout cookie sketch? What about the fact that he had to wear this penis and balls as a superhero thing or this big nose on a black man thing? What about that? Why haven't you addressed that? That's the specificity that this soft ass interview and Boogie should be fucking ashamed of himself for being a part of this, being used by a white man like this. This soft ass interview is fucking nuts, man. Yeah, it bothered me too. I'm getting yeah, angry as I watch this. There, I apologize. I knew the dynamic was trust. I understood that in situations where they may have had turmoil, whether it be with their families, whether it be other castmates, they came to you versus how they made you look. With that said, Amanda Bynes was brought up in the series mm -hmm. and her emancipation and how you were involved in that. Can you talk to us about it a bit? Sure. Um, Amanda <laughs> was between the ages of 16 and 17, and she wanted to get emancipated from her parents, mm -hmm. which was a fairly common thing with successful young actors. It was not at least common. At the time. Sure. It was not um, common. And she wanted that for herself. So she turned to her team, which included her lawyer, her agent, her manager, her publicist, me, because she included me as part of her team, thought of me that way. We supported her. She tried to get emancipated. It ended up not working out. And she didn't. Well, since we're here, let's stay here for a moment. There was also an incident where she had ran away from home. If yes. You would. Um, can you talk to us a little bit just to clear the air of exactly what happened in that situation? Yes. Uh, one night, it was very late, well after midnight, one or two in the morning, Phone rang. I answered. It was Amanda. She was upset. She was in distress. She had had some conflict with her parents, I think her father, and she called me. I was immediately concerned about her safety. I called someone who I knew was fairly nearby. That person was able to go and pick her up. Then I knew she was safe. I felt better. She ended up being taken to the police. Well, regardless of what some people may think, I think it's only positive that you are there for people when they need you. That said, let's talk. Wow. 
That is amazing that he would say that. Jesus Christ that he would say that. He teed up the Amanda Bynes thing and, again, does not press him on the specifics of the situation. Just because Amanda thinks you're part of the team does not mean that you should be part of her team to separate her out from her parents. This was clearly so that you could keep using her to make money off of her. In my opinion, that's my analysis. I'm not saying he did it. I'm saying it's my analysis, my opinion of what I think he, why he was involved in this. Because by separating her out, he could get into her ear, whisper into her, get her on more shows, make more money off of her. And of course, he felt an ownership of her because he discovered her. So uh, as we see on the show, a number of people talk about that when he moved into that more adult show that Amanda Bynes was doing and wanted more control over the situation. And eventually some regular network execs, not child network execs, like child TV network execs, like uh, we're at Nickelodeon, but actual real network execs, huge network execs said like, no, that's stop this. They, we're not going to let you do that. It's enough. And so they made it very clear in the show that he was asked to remove himself from the set and remove himself from Amanda Bynes. So clearly he felt like an ownership to her. He's not owning up to any of that. And the fact the boogies out here saying like, well, I just want to give you credit for always being there for somebody for, and he brought up this story on purpose so that Dan would look good. This is absolutely a Dan Schneider uh, saving my bacon fucking interview. And I am appalled that Boogie would allow himself to be a part of it. I don't even know this guy, Boogie, from Adam, but I'm appalled to see a black man doing this for a white man. It's fucking driving me nuts watching this shit. Talk about some of the things that have just been swirling forever. Okay. You were banned from your set. Never, never, never happened. That is a false rumor. What happened? Add it to the list of false Talk rumors. Talk to me. What happened? Add it to the list of false rumors. There you go. There you go. Throw. I apologize. I apologize. I apologize. There's a lot of false rumors about me, but I apologize. They were adult actresses at the time, and they had their own specific reasons for not wanting to do the show anymore. Mm. I'm not judging that. It got tense, and what they don't know, maybe, is I did everything I could to make that show go away. My producer partner at the time, we would call and say, this is a not a good situation. Okay. So I, I decided I'm gonna do what most showrunners do, which is, you're not on the set. There's a director there to shoot it. I'll go up to the writer's room, I'll work on the next script. But yeah. because everybody was so used to me. See, this is the power thing, right? No one kicked me off my set. I removed myself. No one told me what to do. I removed myself. This is how you see the psychological patterns of an abuser um, and a narcissist is that, oh, no, no, I am I decide what I do. No one, no one made me do anything, right? But I apologize, I apologize, I apologize. But no one tells me what to do. Do you understand? Like this, he's trying to play all these sides, thinking he's figured this out. But like every narcissist, when they try to apologize, it's so motherfucking see through that it's actually shocking to you that they don't see it. Caring about every detail of every show so yeah. much for me not to be on the set. Yeah, maybe some people thought I got banned. So it was more of an assumption because this guy's usually here and now he's not. I don't know if it was an assumption. I don't know if somebody thought they were making me look bad by saying I got banned uh, from the set. I have no idea. Okay. All I know is I was never banned from the set. Yep. The darkest part of So listen to that. When Boogie says, when, well, sorry, when Dan says, uh, I don't have an assumption. I don't know. Maybe someone was trying to denigrate me or make up false rumors about me. Oh, Boogie. Oh, I would say. Okay. I got it. Oh, yeah. See, this whole interview is manufactured so that you as the viewer connect with Boogie, who is asking the soft-ass questions to Dan. Because Boogie is essentially creating a soft marshmallow fucking cotton cloud of, of a, um, a, a placemat for Dan Schneider to fall on and make it seem as if what he did people are making too big of a deal about that he didn't do all these things and it he had a, he had all these other positive things going on so i don't know how much they paid boogie to do this but it might have been i don't i, I, I don't want to say how much it was but it's it's a it, it's it's so hard to watch man of this series discuss child predators now i want to make sure that we clear a couple of things up okay brian peck was not hired by you no, I did not hire Brian Peck. This was a Tolan Robbins production? 
Yeah. Let's pass that and on Drake. And I talked and he told me what had happened. I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career thus far. Mm. And I told him, I'm here for you. What do you need? Which Drake mentioned in the show that we see this is a soft thing you can notice, right? When he says, I was more devastated than happened in my career. This is where the narcissism comes out in really subtle ways. And you have to pay attention to the narcissism when it comes out. He is making Drake's abuse about his career. These are these little things that are give you a tip into how this man views himself. We watched last night. And next, I heard that he went to court when this guy was being tried, Peck. And when Drake walked in, he saw 50 people sitting on the side of the courtroom supporting Pat. Yeah, I wonder who a lot made of that happen. Pretty famous. I wonder, Dan. Of course, Drake was devastated that that happened. And, and even more disappointing, 41 of those people wrote letters for Peck, character letters, praising him for who he was and asking for leniency. And they knew that he was guilty. They knew he had confessed to some degree. I wish Will Friedel and other people would come out and say who told him to write these letters. Ask or, or, or reveal who asked them to write these letters. I would love to know, was it just Brian Peck's attorney or was it other people who were suggesting this to them? Remember, Hollywood can be a very fucked up cabal as we saw recently with um, uh, with Ashton Kutcher and Mila when they wrote those letters of support for Danny Masterson. It can be quite a fucked up cabal for sure. Uh, so I'd like to know who told these people to write these letters of support. I mean, how do you get Alan Thicke and Joanna Kearns to write letters of support for this guy? And they, the pickle guy, the pickle boy. He still did this. It's just, that's baffling that adults would do that. Yeah, And I don't know if people know this, but Drake's mom, a lovely woman who I stay in contact with this day, she came to me at the time and she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And oh boy, would you help me oh with boy. my speech? What is to the this? judge? What are you doing? And I said, Of course. Cut it out. And I did. Cut it out. And he ended up going to prison and serving his time. And yeah, that was probably the darkest part of my career. I think he had something to do with this. I don't mean that he abused Drake, but I think there's a stronger connection between him and Brian Peck than he is letting on. Brian's never going to say anything about it, probably. Um, but I just feel like there's something here. And the fact that it was the mom, remember the dad was the one who was saying very clearly that Brian Peck had predatory instincts and tried to get Brian Peck moved away from him, moved away from Drake, but Brian Peck, through his own maneuvers and possibly being helped by other people here, remember in the series, he talks about him and his friends going to see Drake at all these shows. You know, there was something more going on here. Do you think if Brian Peck knew that he was fucking with one of um, Dan Schneider's dream boys without Dan Schneider's permission that he would go ahead and do that? Do you really believe that? As with as domineering of a fucker this guy was back at the time from the accusations, you think he'd go into business for himself? Get the fuck out of here. Oh, sorry. Jump there. Told him he knew that he was guilty. They knew he had confessed to some of those people. 50 people sitting on that happened. And, and even more disappointing, 41 of those people he knew. Dan, I'm not good with... And... and Here's the kicker that I really don't get. All right, I had to catch and up. yeah, that was probably the darkest part of my career. My career. And here's what the about kicker Drake's life? that I really don't get. After he got out of prison and was, to my knowledge, a registered sex offender, he was hired on a Disney Channel show. I, I don't understand that. Um, you don't understand that? Really? I never. Yeah. Okay. I don't understand. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing it, man. Are you okay? You want to take a minute? Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. You want to yeah. take a minute? Okay. I think we really unpacked some important things. We set the record straight on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Before I let you get out of here, 
I appreciate the. So that moment, I think someone just brought this up in the chat. Uh, who was it here? Yeah. Great catch there, Family Guy 10. Nick versus Disney mentioned. Damn, LOL. He's absolutely right. This is Dan still um, uh, playing for the Nickelodeon team over Disney by taking a shot at Disney. Now, the reason he was fired or hired, Brian Peck was back on the show, is because the director and um, I think one of the writers there, they were husband and wife team. They were the ones running the sweet life of Zach and Cody. They were the one of the ones that defended Brian Peck and probably wrote letters for Brian Peck. And so they they got him on the show. They claimed they had no um, influence on hiring Brian Peck on the show. It just happened to be someone that they really liked that got out on the show. But when Disney found out or got called out for it, they um, released Brian Peck and they re-recorded his stuff that he did. I think he did some voiceovers. So Jesus Christ, man. I mean, it's so he's so transparent in this nonsense. Vulnerability that you use in knowing that there's definitely things that you would have and should have done differently. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that we haven't discussed? Anything that if you could go back and that up your, them, their, their up. journey differently, what would that look like? How, uh, be contrite um, more. Yeah, there's definitely things that I would do differently. Um, one that I think would be really, really important is when you're hiring young actors, minors, to work in television, I would suggest that we have a licensed therapist there to oversee that process for the specific reason of making sure that those kids really wanted to do this job, that they really wanted to be on television. Maybe they should even be informed about what that means. What's it gonna mean if you're famous? What's that gonna mean on social media? What's it gonna mean within your family? Let them find out. And then that way, if a kid doesn't wanna be on a TV show, they can opt out. Yeah. That that psychologist, that therapist could come to us and say, this kid is, is, doesn't want to do it, or their parents aren't, aren't uh, understanding of what's going to come. And then we could avoid the mistake of ever putting a kid in a TV show that didn't want to be there. Um, do you know how much nonsense that is? Like bringing a psych... To, so let me, let me see if I've got this right. You're halfway through shooting a second season of a show that became an international sensation and is making millions upon millions of dollars. But we are totally going to listen to a licensed therapist who comes to us and tells us the lead of this show says they don't want to be a part of the show anymore because now they understand what's involved in this. And we're just going to go ahead and shut production down and we're not going to try to make them stay on the show. What a bunch of bullshit. Holy God, what a bunch of bullshit. What we need to have on the set, and remember, and, and notice how he's not uh, pointing this out. What we need to have on the set is a couple of big, strong motherfuckers who don't put up with any bullshit. So that when a showrunner is being aggressive towards female writers, towards young female actresses, towards young actors, he gets hauled out and beat the fuck up by in, in a back room, or gets called out and gets physically removed from the situation and gets told and gets uh, reported to the execs above him for his behavior so we don't get back into the situation of an, and have another Dan Schneider affecting and wrecking people's lives as and helping them as well, to be fair. And additionally, the main thing that I would change is how I treat people and everyone. I, I definitely at times didn't give people the best of me. I, I didn't show enough patience. I could be cocky and definitely over ambitious. And sometimes oh, over, just straight up re- over ambitious. But what a terrible quality. Rude and obnoxious. And I am so sorry that I ever was. And um, all right. when I watched the show, I could see the hurt in some people's eyes. And it made me feel awful and regretful and sorry. Um, I wish I could go back, you know, especially to those earlier years of my career and bring the growth and the experience that I have now and just do a better job and never ever feel like it was okay to be an asshole to anyone ever. Um, All the cuts back to Boogie are ridiculous. Look, I, I wanted to make funny TV shows for kids and we definitely did that. But if I could go back, I would get it done in different ways. I, I'd just be nicer as often as possible and listen more to the people on my team 
and um, I would do everything that I could to make sure that everyone had a good experience. Uh, that's what I do differently. Dan, I appreciate your time. Shake I appreciate hand. you. Thanks for stopping by. This is Thanks. nonsense. Oh, okay. There you go. That's the end of the year. That was a ridiculous thing at the end there. I would do everything in my power and blah, blah. Basically, hire me again, please. I can do this now. I'm a better person. I can show run your show. Let me work on a show for you. Uh, let me work around kids again. Let me help you find successful people. I, I promise I'll do it differently this time, even though I got railroaded out in 2018 because of the horrible things I'd done on previous sets. I've learned. I know it can be better. Even though I've had zero experience being back on a set after all these accusations, I know that I could be better now. I could do it better. Uh, such hogwash, man. This was a, That was a rough interview to watch. If you're really contrite, you go and find a strong reporter from one of these. I mean, the fact that Hollywood Hollywood Reporter platformed this is a fucking scandal. It is fucking embarrassing that they would allow this to happen. Essentially using an actor slash possibly influencer to ask the softest ass questions you could ask. Soft ass questions, dog. Soft ass questions of this guy and give him all the opportunities to... Um, say the most generalized apologies and then act as if, you know, occasionally it wasn't that big of a deal and then say how he'd be better if he had another shot at it. it this was embarrassing to watch. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how you can look yourself in the mirror after having run an interview like this, especially if you're a father. And he said he's a father. I'm telling you right now, uh, that is insane to me, even more so that you would do that as a father. I mean, if I had kids and I had the chance to interview this fucker, and you know I've interviewed many, many people throughout my career, I would be hammering down on this guy until we got to some real actual truth and not these generalities and fake fucking apologies and fake offenses and fake vulnerability that we saw throughout this interview. This is embarrassing, man. Absolutely embarrassing. And all it does is make me think, because these are all allegations, but it makes me think that what we saw in the series and these things that were said by these people they ring true to me now, having watched this interview even more so, because you can see the narcissism. You can see the little attempts to make it seem as if what he did wasn't that bad and that he's supremely, genuinely sorry when you know he isn't. Not really. He probably tells himself uh, in those quiet moments, I thought I was doing the right thing or these people should be grateful. I, I made them famous. Why are they accusing me? Why are they coming after me? Uh, you know, it's that kind of nonsense that people who um, are successful in life and successful, especially in Hollywood, uh, convince themselves. Well, I made this person famous, so whatever I did, I should be forgiven for because I made this person famous. So, man, that was a tough, tough watch for sure. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Sorry. Uh, let's see if I've got any Streamlabs Super Chats for a wrap up because I got to get over and hang out with my patron, uh, the people who support me here on the Patreon on the Outlaw Nation. For those of you who don't know, the Patreon is back up, patreon.com slash John Roca. You can see all the multiple tiers, uh, but I'm going off to do my hangout here in just a couple of minutes. One last one from George Costanza. George, thanks so much for stopping by. He says, Hi, John. I think you are a beautiful person. Oh, it's very kind. I'm not, but I thank you. And I wish there were more people like you in charge of productions. And in Hollywood, I wish you were cast as a Jedi master in a Star Wars movie. Oh, or better yet, in charge of the direction vision of Star Wars. Oh, uh, no, I don't want that responsibility. But, George, it's incredibly kind of you to say these things. But listen, I want to make it clear to all of you who are watching this. I made mistakes when I was younger. If I was in charge of a writer's room, I don't think I would be able to handle that responsibility. I was such an immature guy, right? Um, but I know I wouldn't have indulged in the things that he indulged in. And those are the differences there. And I think that's what you've got to understand. As you get older, you've got to do the work. You've got to go to therapy. You've got to figure out what the problems are. I had such low self-esteem, low self-worth. I had so many issues in relationships with women because I had such a horrible vision of myself. And I was just, I always thought I wasn't worth it. And so I would just destroy things for myself, self-destroy all the time. It was terrible back then. I, I've gone through the wars. I've gone through the therapy. You know, you guys know I almost took my life in 2016. That supremely changed me fundamentally as a person. And so when I see these things from people who are fake apologizing, it breaks my heart and it makes me so upset because I know 
what it's like to actually be called out on stuff and come to terms with some of your behavior in the past, some of your anger, some of your frustrations, some of your moments when you said some really uh, terrible stuff to a friend or a loved one because you were in a moment of anger. I know what it's like to realize you could lose the most important people in your life and you've got to get the help you need so that you can put away that beast because you are a good person. You are a person of value. You've got to, but you've got to come to terms with those things that that uh, um, corrode you from the inside out and find out why they're there. Do the work to put them to rest and come to terms with them and become a better person. I'm still a work in progress. I'm still learning. I'm still trying to be a better person. I'm still trying not to get into fights on Twitter. I'm still trying not to let the person with 15 followers upset me because they're talking shit about me. I'm still trying to be a better person. I'm learning. I'm not always succeeding, but I'm always trying. And I think that's what matters here. The fact that he hasn't called any of these people, and from what I understand, none of these people in the in the in the documentary received a call from him tells me that he hasn't actually done the work and that he thinks just going on a show with a carefully curated um, apology slash interview is his way of doing the work means he doesn't have a fucking clue how to do the work and his narcissism won't let him do the work. Do the work first and then we can talk about you possibly running another show or being, uh, or being an executive producer on another show. That's what needs to happen. And clearly Hollywood has not seen him do that because even they aren't ready to hand him the keys to another kingdom uh, anytime soon. So uh, it's just painful to watch this kind of stuff, and I feel bad uh, that so many people were damaged and affected by uh, the work they did on his shows. And yes, other people got successful, but uh, I bet there's a, I bet there's some damage or residual damage there with all of them that maybe they're going to come to terms with later on in their lives from their experiences on these sets, man, which seem to be pretty bad. So, all right, there we go. That's what I'm going to say uh, about all of this. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me. I really thought this was going to be a 90-minute show. The fact that it's almost two hours is kind of shocking. 145 of you joining right now, almost 150 for a majority of the show. Thank you very much for taking your time on a Friday to hang out with me on a live episode of The Nation. I'm going to endeavor to do more of these shows at night. I love to talk at night. I'm much more awake and alive at night. And so hopefully you'll see do, me do a live one of these every week again, like I used to back in the old days. It would be a lot of fun. And also address some of the mental health stuff. I know a lot of you have DM'd me and asked me to uh, create segments where we talk about mental health stuff. So I think I'm going to start doing that more and more for me as well as for you all um, who want to watch and, and pay attention to segments like that as well. Just know I've got a lot of that in my mind. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I appreciate it. I hope if any of you have experienced any of this kind of abuse or any of this kind of pain or any of this um, experience of um, uh, working for someone who is toxic and uh, um, messed with your self-esteem and messed with your self-worth, I hope you're finding your way to get the help for yourself that you need. It's really important. It's not a stigma. We're all damaged, man. We're all fucked up from the world. We're all fucked up from our parents or family members or friends or interactions at school or bullies or just life itself, man, coworkers, bosses. All those things have a way of affecting us. And so... It's no shame if you need to go and see someone, a therapist, or see someone, uh, a psychiatrist, to help you navigate this stuff because you want to be a better person. It's important to love yourself and be like, hey, self-care, loving myself, it's not a shame to love myself. Let me find the ways to kind of let go of this anger, let go of this pain, come to terms with this stuff, and not let old shit tell me my self-worth in life going forward in the future. It's important. Clearly... This guy, Dan Schneider, when you strip it all away, there's some real damage inside of this guy from stuff that probably happened in his past and things that he experienced. And the series certainly talks about the fact that he didn't want to just be the fat guy on TV shows anymore. And a guy who struggled with his weight like I have my entire life and I'm struggling big time now uh, as I'm the biggest I've been in a very, very long time, I understand what that the stigma that that comes with and how that can affect you and so uh those are the things you look at you don't want to end up being this toxic aggressive angry person on a set you got to come to terms with yourself and go, go and get some help so you can put that away and treat people better in your life number one treat yourself better in your life because that's really important as well you know if there's anything to take away from this whole series and this whole thing is that there's a lot of damaged people in the world and they're damaged by their experiences, and we need to get 
we need to make help more readily available to people like this so that they can get better and become better and come to terms and put those demons away. My heart broke for Amanda Bynes. My heart broke for Drake Bell, a number of the people on the series as I was watching it. So I hope um, anyone who's watching or listening tonight, watching it later as well, um, if there's any desire you for, to go get therapy, I can't encourage you enough to do so. Um, all right, I'm going to wrap it up there. <coughs> I'm clearly running out of uh, air. So thank you all so much for hanging out with me tonight. Please remember to subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell button. Leave your comments down below if you're watching later. Uh, if you want to send a super thanks uh, to support, of support, you can hit that super thanks button. Send them some support as well. Let me know what your thoughts are about the interview, about all the stuff that happened in the series, about the things I spoke about in my review of the series. Let me know uh, any of those comments that you got. Uh, if you have your own experiences or if you've experienced any things with, uh, on sets, if you've been on sets, things of that nature let me know down in the comment section below uh and hit a like on this video share it on your social media uh and um you can follow me at the roca says on twitter instagram and tiktok and as i said if you want to join the patreon it's patreon.com slash john roca all right y'all are the best thanks so much for hanging out with me take care have a good rest of your weekend and i'll talk to you next time with another brand new episode here of the nation here on the outlaw nation channel peace